Hello, and thank you so much for joining us. Today we are joined virtually by Moses Bratrud of the Minnesota Family Council. Moses, thanks so much for being with us. My pleasure, Kyle. Thank you so much. You guys do good work over there at the Minnesota Family Council, helping to preserve uh, conservative social values. So I want to talk a little bit about your take on the last session and uh, see how you think Minnesota did across various issues. Yeah, so it's really interesting because on the surface, it seems like nothing got done. <laughs> and right. uh, you could say that uh, our legislators uh, uh, should do better, that they owe that they owe more to the people of Minnesota to deal with these serious issues. Uh, but uh and, and we are still looking for the possibility of a special session, um, as you know, which could uh, which some of these issues could come up again. But at the same time, even when certain issues don't uh, come up to the floor for a vote, or even if they do come up to the floor for a vote and are defeated uh, and don't get to the governor's desk, uh, it's really interesting to see uh, the, the wheels within wheels uh, where uh, where things are heading uh, in terms of uh, these issues that we care about, life, family, religious freedom, because what uh, what we're seeing this year that doesn't succeed, uh, we're probably going to see again next year, uh, and there'll be a renewed effort uh, to, to pass that bad, bad legislation, or of course, also for good legislation that didn't make the cut this year. Of course. Yeah, things sort of get into the political ecosystem and then they linger in the water. So even if you don't see a, a definite yes or a definite defeat of a certain idea, it's bound to come back. Uh, what are the main ideas that you're looking for to come back uh, next session? Well, one perennial one uh, that uh, we're, we're glad to say did not make, a hu make huge waves uh, this session is physician-assisted suicide. Now, this is something that comes up almost every session, and it could have easily uh, had hearings and a vote this session because the bill was introduced last year, so it wouldn't have needed to be reintroduced. Uh, so if you're unfamiliar, that's the process where a terminal or even a non-terminal patient uh, ends their life with the help of a physician. It's legal in some states like Washington and Oregon. Uh, we know that Compassion and Choices, which is the big group uh, that advocates for physician-assisted suicide, they've made Minnesota a target. So we know that we're in their sights. We know that uh, this is a, uh, something that really uh, predates upon uh, older people. Uh, it, it plays to their fears. It really... Uh, People are, are made to feel that they're a burden if they if they keep uh, their burden to the health system, they're a burden to their family members. So we've seen that in states and in countries where this has become legal. And of course, we simply don't believe that yeah, your life is something that you can uh, you know fritter away in that fashion. So that's something that we oppose. So we're glad to say uh, that that didn't um, uh, didn't get a hearing, did not get a floor vote, did not go to the governor's desk this year. What happens? But we are unfortunately looking for it to come back next year. Oh, yeah, no, of course, they, they seem to be pretty insistent on this. But what, what happens in a physician-assisted suicide, a state that allows physician-assisted suicide? What happens when an insurance company decides that it's not worth it to continue providing care to an old person? I mean, who gets to make that call of when it's no longer efficacious to administer treatment and they decide to euthanize somebody? What happens when the money runs out? Who's in charge? The, you know, the, the selling point with physician assisted suicide is that it's never up to the physician or never up to the insurance company. It's only the patient's own choice. But in fact, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, and in reality, there's pressure being put on uh, people, say a terminal cancer patient, uh, by by physicians, by family members, perhaps uh, the the strain of the uh, of of uh, insurance coverage, uh, leading to medical debt, which is uh, I think one of the biggest causes of bankruptcy in this country, and that's generally for non-terminal patients. So it's it's a really it's a frightening prospect that uh, we could see outside groups. Um, uh, uh, really taking advantage of Minnesotans. I mean, it's unbelievably dystopian. On one hand, the left distrust the medical industrial complex. They distrust insurance companies. They distrust big pharma. And on the other hand, they want to give these groups the power to euthanize the elderly. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's impossible to understate how strange that is. It really is. Very bizarre. Another thing we saw on the floor was something called the Equal Rights Amendment. I know you guys have engaged with that issue a little bit. Tell us what is it and uh, how did that work out last session? Yeah, so that, that bill made it a little further uh, than the physician-assisted suicide bill. It's another one that comes up every year. And the Equal Rights Amendment, uh, people, people kind of hear that and they think, oh, what's wrong with that? Uh, you know, we like equal rights in the United States, and that's true. 
Um, and the Equal Rights Amendment dates back to the 1970s, in fact, um, the idea that there shall be no discrimination on the basis of sex. So it was really a feminist women's rights issue. And uh, at that time, there was a nationwide campaign to make it uh, an amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which failed. Uh, but since then, it's been it, it comes up uh, uh, very frequently. However, there's been a really interesting change. Uh, we don't any longer speak about discrimination on the basis of sex. Uh, the Minnesota, uh, the, the version considered by the Minnesota legislature for the last few years wants to ban discrimination on the basis of gender. And there are a couple mm. problems with that. Uh, the first is that gender does not exist. It's not a real thing. Uh, it, it's, it was invented. I, I mean, it, it's a real thing in, in language uh, in linguistics, but it doesn't actually apply to um, the human race. Uh, that's just a sociological concept. And, uh, but more, more importantly, it doesn't have a definition in Minnesota law. So uh, it would, it would, the, the problem then would be as we've you know seen constantly that anybody could identify as whatever gender and so any th type of thing could be discrimination against anyone <laughs> so it, it becomes legally meaningless um uh in point of fact however uh, it would be used by activist courts uh and we've seen this in other states where this has been passed this is not guesswork on my part um in new jersey where they have a, a an era on the basis of uh gender um, it, it has become this, uh, this, this right to abortion because it would be discrimination against people of whatever gender can get pregnant now, um, uh, any of the thousand genders that can get pregnant. It would be discrimination against them if they were not able to receive uh, an abortion paid for by the taxpayer. So – so that's the that's the that's the two horns of the ERA. First of all, it uh, deals with gender instead of sex, and a gender is a meaningless concept. And second, it's basically taxpayer funded abortion. So we pose that, and we're glad to say that it. Uh, although there was a lot of action on it, it did not. Uh, it did not get a, or it did get a floor vote in the Senate actually, uh, which which uh, was defeated, and it will not be making it to the governor's desk. Well, that's very interesting. I did not know that gender does not have a legal definition in Minnesota, only sex. Uh, that's, I don't know how I came so far in politics without realizing that, but how in it's this amendment... It's because gender is so recent. Gender, you know, it, right. it, it really, there's been no need. I don't think it's used in more than a couple state laws, if at all. Uh, I think it is used in a couple state laws, but there's never any statutory definition given. How many genders are possible under the Equal Rights Amendment? Does it make any attempt to define what the genders are, or does it leave it to be a free-for-all? And it makes no attempt at all. So there's there's as many genders as uh, as people can invent. Interesting. And we're sure the good sociologists and other people in our trusted universities will come up with a long list of genders for us to engage with. What other measures uh, were you monitoring during the session? One one issue, and this is a really uh, a really difficult issue. Another one that comes up uh, every year is uh, the idea of a conversion therapy ban. And this is one that gets a lot of a lot of bad press. Uh, the idea is that um, conversion therapy is supposed to be this practice by which uh, someone who feels uh, that they uh, that they feel perhaps attracted to people of the same sex, but they don't want to, that they would have access to some type of um, uh, compassionate, voluntary uh, therapy that would address that. Um, now, what's interesting is that I've been following this issue for several years, and we, we hear frequently that any type of activity like that is torture. It's torture for someone to voluntarily say, I have, I'm having these desires. I don't want to have these desires. Can I get some help? The fact is every Minnesotan should have the right to get the counseling and care that they want, that they, that they need uh, in, these, in these scenarios. Uh, and so that's, that's what we want to ban. But it's interesting – uh, th that throughout this discussion over the past few years, I've 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 listened, I've sat through hours of testimony, and I have never actually heard of someone who went through a practice in Minnesota that I consider to be uh, really like horrible, you know, torturous. You know, the, the word the word torture is thrown around. You'll definitely get there'll definitely be people who come in and say, you know, I, I went to a summer camp in some Southern state and they told me that I was going to, they, they, they did some bad thing or whatever. 
Mm-hmm. And we're not talking about some southern state. We're talking about Minnesota law. We're talking about Minnesota professional standards. What can mental health practitioners actually do in Minnesota? And that's already really strictly regulated. So we feel relatively confident that people who are in therapy in Minnesota, including minors who want to address uh, unwanted same-sex attraction or gender dysphoria, that they're there voluntarily, uh, that they've made that decision with their families. So we don't see the need uh, to to uh, put this this type of ban in practice because we're not seeing any practices that we think in Minnesota that we think need to be banned. So unfortunately, it's an issue that's really politicized. It becomes um, uh, it becomes a an absolute moral circus where one side uh, claims to have this um, uh, complete moral uh, superiority and uh, and other people are, are are bludgeoned with that. But uh, that's an issue, again, that uh, although it, there was various various movement uh, on that issue, it did not it's not going to make it to the governor's desk. It's very interesting how the left is acutely concerned with, you know, children in southern states that are not Minnesota. Uh, being coerced into going to conversion therapy, but they have absolutely no problem with it, and they call you a conspiracy theorist if you have a problem with the opposite happening in schools. Drag shows in schools, completely acceptable. Uh, you know, a child willingly going to talk to somebody about the sexual urges that they might be having and work through those in a compassionate way, that's torture, that's terrorism, that's illegal. Very strange double standard. Indeed. Uh, I know that there were some abortion bills that were on the floor. I'm sure you guys were acutely interested in those as well. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I mean, uh, like like other, uh, as you can imagine, that's probably our biggest our biggest single issue. Right. And um, after the the Dobbs uh, Supreme Court leak on May second, there was a flurry of uh, of action uh, on uh, on some of these uh, really nasty pro abortion bills. And uh, there's one uh, in particular called the uh, Patient, uh, the Protect Reproductive Options Act. And it's really interesting because if I it go back, going back to Roe v. Wade, the whole idea bet- behind Roe v. Wade is that there's a, a right to privacy in the U.S. Constitution. Now, of course, that's not actually spelled out, but previous court cases had established that there was a right to privacy. Roe v. Wade said, yeah, and that right to privacy uh, in the penumbras and emanations of the text of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, there is the right to an abortion. And what's interesting is that uh, when Minnesota Supreme Court uh, took the uh, made the decision in in 1995 uh, to kind of mirror Roe v. Wade in the Doe v. Gomez decision and uh, incidentally, that's the reason why abortion won't become illegal in Minnesota immediately, even if Roe v. Wade is overturned at the national level, which we certainly hope it will be. So we have work to do on that score. But the Minnesota Supreme Court took the same route. They said that there's a right to privacy in the Minnesota Constitution. And oh, by the way, that means that you can have an abortion whenever you want at taxpayer expense. And that's an interesting definition of privacy, but I'll let the lawyers deal with that. Uh, In the meantime, the uh, progressive legislators in Minnesota have tried to codify this into Minnesota law, because just like on the federal level, Roe v. Wade was never a federal law. It was just a Supreme Court case, and every attempt to make it law failed, just like the last attempt uh, that uh, that, – uh, the the Democrats in the Senate tried, uh, Senator Schumer tried to bring forward an exercise in futility. So it was an exercise in futility in Minnesota as well. Uh, but essentially, it says that everyone shall have the right to have an abortion, and that there should be no no limits whatsoever placed on that. It would, I think, be construed as uh, removing all of the. Uh, pro-life legislation that we have worked to pass over the years in Minnesota, such as the 24-hour waiting period and uh, women's right to know, which makes sure that women are have an accurate idea of what an abortion is before, uh, before they have that appointment. So uh, we're really glad that that bill was defeated. It would have, uh, we've seen similar bills pass in other states like New York, and it would have made uh, Minnesota not, uh, we're already one of the 10 most radical states in the country uh, when it comes to abortion, but it would have put us in the top five, uh, certainly if that had passed. Taking the temperature of the room in Minnesota, where do you feel the average person actually stands on these radical measures? Third trimester abortions, abortion on demand with no waiting period. 
Do most people in the state support this, or is this more insulated in the far left elements of St. Paul? You know, I've looked at a lot of polling on this, uh, you know, recently I've, with this issue, and I've appeared on a, a lot of uh, of news programs actually talking about this because it's actually very clear that Minnesotans don't support abortion on demand in the third yeah. trimester. Um, Minnesotans, a majority of Minnesotans, uh, something like 58 to 63 percent support uh, either abortion being entirely illegal or illegal in most cases uh, or legal with uh, very big exceptions. And generally the exceptions that people uh, point to is that they want abortions to be limited to the first trimester. Now, I don't want there to be abortions at all, but we have to read the room and understand that there are Minnesotans who think that abortion should be legal in the first trimester. That's a fact. And um, But if you put those people together with people who want it to be illegal completely or only legal in the case of rape or incest, then that forms a majority. So that is what the majority of Minnesotans, a supposedly purple state, that's what we actually want. And I saw that a, 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 a straight up majority of, of Americans, when polled on the case at issue in Dobbs, Mississippi's 15 week abortion ban, almost 60 percent of Americans supported a 15 week abortion ban, uh, the issue with Do- uh, which is at issue in Dobbs. So I think we can say confidently that Minnesotans do want to see our abortion laws change in a direction that would protect children. And also, of course, we want to see women protected as well. We want to see women protected from uh, abortion directors, uh, abortion doctors and clinics who are coercing them. Uh, We know how Planned Parenthood makes their money. Uh, We know how these doctors are paid. There's, 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 there is an abortion industrial complex in this state. We have one of the biggest abortion clinics in the Midwest in St. Paul. And, and so, and the, and the, a new clinic was just opened up near the airport and that's very strategically Mm. placed so that women can fly here after abortion, uh, Lord willing, is made illegal elsewhere and get abortions here when they're not available in their home states. And I think it's really clear that Minnesotans do not want our state to become an abortion mecca. They don't want this to be a place where this gruesome, barbaric procedure is available after more sensible states have made it illegal. So I think we have a lot of a lot of um, a lot of opportunity. I think the pro-life movement will uh, galvanize voters this fall in a way that we've never seen before. And I hope that we can say that that next year I'll have uh, you and I can come back and have this conversation and we can say that the that the legislative uh, that our legislators took real positive progress to uh, to protect life and also to protect women in Minnesota. My hope as well, absolutely. The last question I have about abortion, where do you think that disconnect occurs? Is it that people don't understand how pro-abortion their legislators are? Is it the legislators ignoring the will of the people? Is it an education issue? I mean, how do we end up with legislators that are so far beyond the public sentiment on this problem? You know, that's a really interesting political question. I've, I've, uh, I've, I've seen a couple articles recently asking why, how did we move from the Democratic Party of Bill Clinton's era when abortion was supposed to be safe, legal, and rare to, uh, to uh, now when the, 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 the slogan is abortion on demand at any time without apology or shout your abortion. That's, an, that's a newer organization. And I think the, I, you know, I'm not a political, uh, uh, well, I am a political junkie, but I'll, I'll give you my two cents. Uh, and I guess I, I work in politics. It seems to me that if you're defending something while admitting that it's shameful, while admitting that it's something that is undesirable, while admitting that it's something that uh, you would not want your daughter to have or would not recommend uh, your friend to have, something that you want to be rare, right? If you're saying abortion should be rare, if you're admitting that at all, then you're giving too much ground to the people who rightly understand abortion to be morally impermissible, completely barbaric. So, Ultimately, you're on shifting sand if you're saying that it should be safe, legal, and rare. Ultimately, you have to move to a position, you have to move in one of two directions. You have to move to a position where you should say, yeah, it should be so rare that it should never happen because it's morally repugnant. Or you have to move to a position and, uh, and say, it's morally wonderful. It's the, literally the best thing you can do morally. Uh, also a great way of reducing your carbon footprint, presumably. So you have to say that abortion is amazing. 
that's that's the that's the political rhetorical strategic move that you have to make if you're a political strategist if you're a left wing uh, progressive candidate now that's what that's what politicians have done politicians on the left but the country has not moved with them right. so there's articles in the atlantic there's articles in the economist saying democrats are trying to do too much with abortion some people say that they're going to get a huge boost from uh, Roe v. Wade being overturned, if indeed that's what happens. But I don't think so. And I, I think the the consensus is um, – I, I actually heard a, a, a Democratic political strategist quoted. Um, he was quoted anonymously uh, and he said – yeah, Roe v. Wade going away uh, could help us in some marginal districts, but what we really need to win in the fall is for inflation to go away, <laughs> <laughs> because that's a, a bread and butter issue for more people. Yeah, I think that's very astute political analysis, and that observation really explains a lot of how the left operates. They they go 100% all of the time. I mean, the conservative equivalent would be uh, saying, you know what, AR-15s are good. Let's also repeal the you know the 1986 law and bring back machine guns and you just don't see the right doing that in the same way that the left does the left goes all the way up to the wall whether the voters want it or not and it's working for them which is why it's so important that we have people like you acting as the counterbalance uh, last thing I want to ask you about gambling uh, I saw so much coverage of this towards the end of session and I didn't even know it was a contentious issue and then I saw like a dozen articles pop up in my timeline about mobile gambling and trying to bring sports betting to Minnesota. People were really obsessed with this towards the end of session. Why? Well, why was the left so insistent on gambling? You know, it's a really interesting issue. And it's also a bipartisan issue. There are certainly conservatives, perhaps among mm. your audience, who really think we should expand, uh, expand gambling in the state. Minnesota has relatively strict gambling laws. But um, but I don't agree with that. Uh, so, so the 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 bill under discussion would have expanded sports gambling. I think it would have allowed for online sports betting. All of our neighbor states do that. I think only Iowa allows for online uh, sports uh, betting. Now, uh, the 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 real problem with this is it's kind of like: do we want more gambling in our society, less or the same? Mm -hmm. Now, I don't. Personally, I don't have the biggest moral problem in the world with gambling. But the thing about it is that it's an addictive behavior. Um, compulsive gambling addiction is a real thing. Um, when this had a hearing in the Minnesota Senate, it was actually a, a Democratic senator, Senator Marty from Roseville, who brought up the point that uh, compulsive gambling not only often leads to bankruptcy, uh, divorce, um, uh, crime because uh, he, he brought up the example of someone he personally knew who engaged in armed robbery to fuel her compulsive gambling habit. Wow. But uh, it, uh, I mentioned bankruptcy. And also, of course, it leads to suicide because uh, financial woes are uh, are a huge driver when, when people commit suicide or attempt suicide. And I think he said one in six compulsive gamblers will attempt suicide. And when you're expanding gambling access, and especially uh, when you're expanding it, especially when, um, when there aren't really uh, good safeguards to keep, uh, to keep uh, this from being accessed by young people, uh, which would mean like having it online, then you're really, uh, you're really, you're really not doing the people of our state uh, a service. Uh, Senator Kiffmeyer, a Republican uh, from uh, Big Lake, I think, she also made the point that it's really all about the money. It's mm -hmm. not that Minnesotans are, you know, uh, outside the Capitol door just rallying for uh, gambling access. It's that the people who stand to make a great deal of money off of this, uh, the national uh, betting firms, um, the name of which I'm, I'm going to forget them, so I won't even try. But the, the national gambling firms, uh, they want to expand. They want to expand into Minnesota. They want our hard-earned money. And we already have the Minnesota Lottery. We already have the casinos. Do we want to expand that? And my answer to that is no. And I think many Minnesotans agree with that. They understand that gambling victimizes people who are already victimized by the state, by private corporations, and uh, and they, they don't want to see more of that in their communities, certainly not in their schools. So I think uh, many people are also glad that gambling uh, expansion is not going to pass the governor's desk. 
I see what you're saying here, because I also, I'm not sure how transgressive it is to pull the lever of a slot machine if you're on vacation, but I see what you're saying where it's just another avenue for moral corruption. And America has enough problems already. We have enough vices. And especially if you look at it from the perspective of children. I mean, children are so susceptible in those formative years to addictive behaviors and giving them unfettered access to something they really don't understand, which is the value of money and gambling. Uh, that will pose concerns. And I'm sure these companies would make it as addictive as possible. I mean, it's in their best interest to make the interface slick, easy to use. They'd probably market it to children. I mean, look at all the other vices that are marketed to children, various forms of addiction, pornography, nicotine. These are all marketed to children, even though they're supposedly for adults. So I definitely see why you're taking that uh, stance of opposing online gambling in this I think it's, the question is, do you want your 17-year-old or your 18-year-old even to be on their phone and the app that they're addicted to on their phone is not Angry Birds. It's um, it's FanDuel or one of these other sports right. betting apps. And they're spending hours per day on it. But not just that. They're frittering away their college savings playing these games. And right. I think that's the vision that I see in and you know that's why we uh, we oppose that. that like so many other things, this political question comes down to framing. Are you framing it as you know uh, adults should be able to pull the lever on a slot machine, or are you framing it as look where this slippery slope could lead? And I think recent years show that these slippery slope arguments that were previously described as fallacies, people are starting to realize that it's real. And the social conservatives were right. I mean, look at look at how many things the Christian right called, whether it's transgenderism in the schools or in this case, uh, identifying that we're at the top of the gambling slope. So I think it's important that you're in front of that one. It's really exhausting to be so right all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure. Uh, so what's your plan moving forward? What are you looking for next session? And what are your thoughts about the conclusion of this one? Well, as you said earlier, Kyle, nothing is ever really over in politics. Right. I would say I would I would uh, bet money if I was a betting man <laughs> that we'll see all of these issues again uh, next session. And I think particularly we're going to see a, a focus on abortion next session, whatever the Supreme Court decision is. But especially if they're uh, let, let's say let's let's imagine that the Supreme Court overrules uh, overturns Roe v. Wade, and then in the Minnesota uh, elections this fall. We see uh, Republicans uh, take back control of the House of Representatives uh, uh, and uh, and strengthen their majority in the Senate. And whether or not they they lose the governor, or they win the governor's seat. What we'll see in the legislature is a flurry of bills, and it'll come from the the radical pro-abortion legislators, and it will come from pro-lifers, and there'll be a real battle royale over what Minnesota's abortion laws will be now that Roe v. Wade, that national precedent that uh, that um, didn't allow Minnesotans to, uh, to 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 choose for ourselves what we want our laws to be. If that's gone, there will be um, next year will be the abortion session. Um, that's that's my prediction as of right now. Absolutely. Well, we look forward to hearing your analysis when that comes, and we hope to have you back very soon to continue these important discussions. If people want to get more involved with Minnesota Family Council, and we'd love to, we'd love to bring in as many uh, socially conservative people as possible into our movement. Um, we already have a, a, a really big ground game going into the 2022 election, bringing faith-based conservative voters to the polls, educating people, going to churches across the state. If people want to get involved, go to mfc.org uh, forward slash subscribe. You can get our weekly updates, get our podcast, get our newsletter, what's going on in Minnesota, and stay informed on the issues that matter. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. 